Thank you for that kind introduction, Megs. Our next presenter today is our keynote speaker, and it is former U.S. Congressman Dennis Kucinich. I met him last year on the playa by chance, and I happened to actually be wearing this jacket on the day that I met him, and I ran into him the next night and invited him to come on an art car. And it's funny how the playa works that way. I w had lost my friends. I was waiting for them to come back, and I just happened to be standing where I was standing, and he crossed my path, and I said, hey, Dennis, we're about to go on an art car. Would you like to come? And he goes, yeah. <laughs> so we're waiting, and everybody comes, and everybody's in costume, and he's wearing his cargo pants and a, a, like a zip up. And I said, Dennis, would you like to wear a hat? And, and a scarf, and he goes, yeah. <laughs> so I ran back to, to my little house, and I dug out my coolest hat that I could find, which is my leather aviator bomber hat, and my favorite scarf, and I took it to him, and I gave it to him to put on, and I said, people here are really playful. <laughs> he said, I'm playful. So we went and got on the art car. The music's really loud. It's super loud house music. It's I yell over the music. Dennis, do you like dance music? He goes, I do. <laughs> I said, Dennis, do you have any dance moves? He says, I've got some moves. <laughs> so we made our way out to an art sculpture. And the, the art car pulled up. And we had a dance party. And he's got some moves. Dennis started his professional career on the local level. He's from Cleveland, Ohio. He started there as a social activist. He then became a city councilman and moved up to become the youngest mayor that has ever been elected to a big city. He was 31 when he became the mayor of Cleveland. <laughs> he spent 16 years as a US congressman as a representative of Ohio. During that time, he worked and continues to work as a leader for peace, environmental protection, workers' rights, and monetary policy. He ran for president in 2004 and 2008. And it is our distinct pleasure to have him here to share his wisdom. He is going to be speaking on the topic of having had a long track record taking on projects that seem insurmountable, where everybody says it can't be done or this can't be fixed, and then changing the outcome. Dennis is in the process of writing his latest book. It will be coming out next year. And you can also find him as a TV news analyst on, wait for it, Fox News. <laughs> Why? Because he provides the fair and balanced part. <laughs> Please welcome Dennis. Rosie, Rosie, thank you so much for that uh, very kind introduction. And after I heard her speak about my dance moves, I thought I was going to moonwalk up here. But, uh, <laughs> but I'll, I'll save that for the playa. Uh, I'd, I'd like to begin by, by thanking uh, Marion uh, for the work that she does and for her leadership. And to thank uh, Larry for his uh, Guiding Genius, and Crimson for the work that they did together collaboratively to help start a movement. I also would, would like to uh, recognize uh, Megan and to, um, uh, again, thank Rosie for uh, making it possible for me to be here to, so that we can talk about the significance of, of, uh, of what you do 
as people who come from all over this country and all over the world, uh, we are, as each person here knows, we're moving into a world that people can't even imagine where the notions which people have about economics, about work, about themselves, uh, it's all changing. There's different notions arising of meaning of life. What, what is meaningful in life? Uh, people are really focusing more today, I find, on creating harmonious relationships, uh, not simply between each other interpersonally, but within communities and, and within the whole world. The, the guiding impulse of our time is this uh, motion and movement towards human unity. There is an awareness that uh, we are all one. We are interconnected. We are interdependent. And people are beginning to act on that. We, we've seen uh, how technology has both advanced and followed that uh, through, th through the creation of, of an internet. Uh, but really, truly, we're looking at a time, an epoch in human history of an internet of everything, where everything is connected. And this, um, uh, and while that's happening, we're moving away from consumption. I think we're actually could be speaking sometime soon about a post-capitalist society, where it's not about <laughs> where, where it's not about having stuff. It's about we move from having to being. This this notion of of our our existence and our value as a person, not, not depending on how many um, integers are in our bank account. Uh, there, th so th this, this old system, which is, which is in its death throes, it, it just, it's not viable anymore, and all dimensions, all dimensions in our world are open to transformation. Uh, we are really at, the threshold of a fresh start of creating a, a new civilization. A new civilization. This goes way beyond concepts of rebellion. Because rebellion inevitably have inherent in them uh, dichotomies of us versus them. We're talking about a, a, a radical inclusiveness and within that, a, a radical independence of self, merging with the whole. The, um, a guiding principle can be found in America's first motto, E Pluribus Unum. Out of many, we are one. Uh, so within this unity, we still see a multiplicity, and that can be expressed, and there's power in that. We don't always, we don't have to be all alike in order to be one, but when we come from the diversity, the richness, the textures of our humanity, and we merge, there is created a oneness where the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, and in that paradox, we can find a way of achieving a dynamic equilibrium in which exists peace, in which exists a contemplation of the power of, of our oneness. As we call forth a new world, we contemplate that new world in our own inner knowledge, and we summon to help create that new world the fire, the fire within, that fiery heart, the heart being the organ of transformation, because the heart knows all, the heart sees all, the heart hears everything, the heart is in touch with the world, and, and through that heart, we not only perceive the world, but the the interchange between our heart and the world, and our sympathies and our compassion, that, that interchange helps to expand the notion of our own being, the meaning of our own being. So 
The, another element of hard, if you take the, the, um, the derivation of the word hard, it comes from the French word cour, and that is also a, a, uh, a, a word that, from which courage, courage issues forth. As we become these luminous, fiery beings who, who are engaged with the world on subtle but very active levels at some point, we, we tap the energy of the heart, which is to come into an awareness of courage. One of the greatest, most suffocating challenges in the world today is that fear has descended upon the world. Fear is being used and propagated for political purposes. Fear is being used for commercial purposes. Fear becomes a, a, a guiding um, order of, of the times. And yet, with the power of the human heart, we have the ability to let that heart and its luminous quality be as the light which shines in the darkness that dissipates the darkness of fear, that enables us to be able to not just shed light in a moment, but light up the world. That really is what the transformation of Burning Man brings. It, it's a community of transformation. When I stepped out for the first time onto the playa last year, uh, it, it, was a, it was a moment where I said, well, okay, I'm home. <laughs> uh, uh, and um, and I, I saw the, it was the, the colors, the textures, the forms, the, um, that that imaginarium that, that all of us hold within us, but we, we, we don't always get a chance to see a physical representation of, of, the, of the images and the, the fantasies that sweep through our head about the world that can be. And suddenly, I stood there, and I saw a representation of it. And I thought, how, how miraculous, how beautiful. And, and I. And, and, and how true. If you remember Keats, beauty is truth. Truth is beauty. The, the interchangeability of those principles, I saw represented. And, and, in, and, in, and truth as equates to light. When you stand, when you, when you move through the play at night and you see how the darkness is illuminated in so many different ways, you start to think about how each person has the ability to bring their own awareness into the world, their own consciousness, and to let that light of awareness penetrate the darkness in ways that are so beautiful. And, and I saw the potential of that, just physically represented. We, we all have this yearning for transformation. We all have this yearning for transcendence. I think that each one of us lives, if, if only for a moment, to, to experience that. When you see uh, young people in particular go to, go to rock concerts and they connect with performers in, in ways that are extraordinary, and, and there, there's this um, uh, energy field that's created, and it's a unified energy field. Um, people yearn for that. They yearn for the connectivity. Uh, and they, and and what, it, what it is underneath all that, I believe, is a desire for a transformation of the, uh, of the material world. And yet, the interchangeability of matter and spirit is happening all the time. We are called upon to bring those spiritual principles into the material world, to elevate the material world and make it purposeful, give it some meaning, literally sanctify it. And that, that cyclical or reciprocal relationship between matter and spirit is something that's going on all the time. And the, it, is, it is the awareness of that gives us the ability to understand that the transformation, the, the movement of, 
of spirit into matter and of matter into spirit, that nexus, at that nexus, that's a point of extraordinary potential for creativity. The, the temper of our times, while it's filled with fear, underneath it is the desire for human unity, the, the desire for um, a shared awareness of our, of our oneness, and, and it, not just our interdependence and interconnection with each other, but our connection with the natural world. We have seen in our times such a disassociation with the natural world. It is as if the global climate is out there. <laughs> it is as if water, which we are made of, is out there. Um, and yet, the great philosopher Thomas Berry has, has taught us that uh, the work of our lives ought to be a reconciliation with nature, which means with ourselves. And we, it's our separation from the natural world which is creating so many of the, of the stresses in our planet today. So the burning, and, and, I, and the things that I've said in the last few minutes are, are not things that are new to anybody here, uh, but how do we move then from awareness, from having this awareness, how do we move from awareness to action? And, th and that's really what I want to focus on in the next few minutes. I want to share with you my experience as someone who started as a very young person at a local level, uh, working in a neighborhood where people often were not ready to defend themselves. Silence, spiritually, is very powerful. Silence, politically, is fatal. At a neighborhood level, I found that people would not often speak out when they had changes and cuts in bus service, which were so essential. So I showed up at local meetings of the transit board and started to give my opinion. Uh, the city was planning various projects for the community that didn't really relate to the community's needs. Show up at a meeting and give my opinion. Uh, there was uh, very serious air pollution. And people would get together to talk about it. Well, I'd show up, give my opinion, and also find out others who shared it. And then start to come together to find ways of letting our collective opinion be known. In each case, it was about standing up, maybe when no one else would, yesterday I had the opportunity to meet someone who was a descendant of uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson. And, and Emerson uh, once wrote about being in a meeting, in his essay in Self-Reliance, he, he writes about being in a meeting where Someone st stood up and spoke, and he talked about his words coming back to him with an alienated majesty. <laughs> Each one of us has had the experience of sitting in an audience and hearing someone st thinking something, really feeling it strongly, and having someone else get up and say it. We we've all had that. Uh, In mass, we could reflect on the uh, teaching of, of Carl Jung, who talked about the collective, unarticulated consciousness. We all have feelings about what's going on. They're often not voiced. So what's uh, kind of uh, new rules? <laughs> Standing up. Um, speaking out. Stepping forward. Years ago, there are there, uh, these uh, slapstick comedians, uh, Abbott and Costello had a, um, uh, th there was one routine they were, they were at where uh, the people were being signed up in a foreign legion. And so they're all lined up, Abbott and Costello are in the line. And they were, the uh, head of the legionaries was asking 
for a volunteer to come forward on a dangerous mission. And so what you saw happening was, let's say there were 10 people in line, Abbott and Costello are in line, and nine people stepped back. <laughs> and there's uh, poor Abbott standing there, and he gets chosen to lead the mission, right? Well, well sometimes that's how leaders are chosen. <laughs> you know, hello. But, but, but if, you, if you actually step forward, there's real power in that. And, and I, I advocate stepping forward. We have to look at our own motivation when we do step forward. I've been motivated about a, by a sense of fairness, a sense of, of justice. But one wants to ask oneself, before that moment of, of engage, before we step forward or ask others to do that, people have to ask themselves, what do you care about? What does this thing you may become involved in, what does it really mean to you? And one must ask oneself, where are you needed? And what can and will you do? For each one of you who is or could be a potential civic activist or could call a community of activists forward wherever you're from, one of the, some of the great barriers to activism are mental. Uh, I have had the experience myself many times. At, at every point in my life, people come up when you want to get involved in something, something and somebody says, look, there's nothing you can do. You think of the staying power of that. If you buy that, you own that, that then is writ. Or people who will say, it's over. Forget about it. You accept that? Uh, that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy which not only holds in place that which is and may be wholly objectionable, but also stops one's own self from getting involved, from injecting oneself. Uh, and what's behind it is a feeling that, well, you can't change the outcome. And, and I'm here to tell you uh, not only that you can, but here's how. First of all, you really, whatever you're going to get involved in, you have to know your subject. And, and it's uh, three things. Research, research, research. <laughs> uh, information is so accessible today, but it's not often used. We may care about something and want to articulate our feelings, but let me tell you that the uh, importance of really getting grounded in as much fact as you can come up with cannot be overstated. The importance cannot be overstated. You, it is, it is, it is a, an ethical responsibility that we have to, to really plumb the depths of understanding of what it is we're talking about. Uh, and when you want to get involved, and, and this is where the Burning Man uh, energy is infused. You envision the alternative outcome. You don't like this, what is it that you want? If we are to be as architects of new worlds, you better have the plans in your back pocket at least. <laughs> and so envision it and put it down. That concrete plan is so important because that's your roadmap. And the next thing is you, you know, so the first is, is to, to know your subject. The second is envision an alternative outcome. The third is you develop a concrete plan. The fourth is enlist the help of people who are like-minded. They're out there. They're the ones who are sitting in the audience who, when you stand up and speak out, they're saying, gee, I wish I would have said that. I think the same thing. And the next is communicate at every level that you can. Today with social media, we have the ability to communicate so instantaneously, so extraordinarily, and to m bring people together quickly. And, and we have to be ready to do that. And as you communicate to organize, 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 you know, research, 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 communicate, 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 organize, organize, organize. Uh, so 
Fourth, enlist the help of like-minded people. Fifth, communicate. Sixth, organize. Seven, you work your plan. And eight, be relentless. <laughs> Cheerfully. <laughs> All the, all, all the world uh, loves a cheerful relentlessness. <laughs> uh, years ago, uh, when I, just before I became mayor, I was actually elected mayor of Cleveland on a, on a promise to save the city's municipal electric system. But when I was in city council, the electric system was actually sold. It was sold, done, <laughs> auctioned, done. And it was sold to a utility monopoly, which had conspired for years to take it over. It was a, one of the dirtiest things I'd ever seen in politics. And I was told when I saw that happen, ah, there's nothing you can do about it. There is, it's done. It's sold, Dennis. You know what sold means? <laughs> um, and I... I came to a moment where I, I, I just felt so, it was so wrong, I went into my library, I dug up a book about uh, 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 um, the mayor of Cleveland who, who at the turn of the century, it was his vision that created this electric system which provided the people of the city by the time uh, I got into politics with electricity at 25% uh, cheaper than was provided by the private power company. And it, and it kept taxes low in the city. It, was, it, it, was, it, 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 it did a lot of things that had real economic value. Well, now it was, being, it was sold. And so I, I read about Tom Johnson's history in creating Muni Light, and there was a moment that I, I felt like I, I heard from him when I'm reading about him saying, don't let, the, don't let them sell this. And I'm saying, Mayor, it's already sold. But, you know, and the conversation I had with him wasn't about communicating with the dead. It was about his ideals, which were alive. <laughs> so, so I'm going to read to you. Uh, Rosie mentioned that uh, I've written a book which is going to be published uh, next year. But I've got, a, I've got a draft here. I'm just going to read to you an excerpt from that it's to give you an idea how you go into a situation where people say there's nothing you can do and how the process actually worked, how I did it. I want to share this with you. Uh, Mayor Johnson's ideals were still alive. It was up to me to give them expression and to take a stand that had a clear moral dimension. Muni light was being stolen. I knew it. I had to act. Everything I had ever learned, how to create an issue, how news is made, how to challenge government decisions, how to take something that was at a conclusion and turn it around, how to rally the public, how to change the outcome would be brought to bear in the cause of saving Muni Light. In my house, I have a glass globe with a cityscape of Cleveland. When the globe is shaken, artificial snow, which settled at the bottom, begins to stir. The more the globe is shaken, the more snow stirs until a virtual blizzard is created. Events are often created in the same way. Stirred and shaken by external forces, they confront, confound, become irresistible, insist upon attention and resolution. That restless evening, I took a uh, yellow notepad <laughs> in hand and sitting at the top of the steps of my home under a stark white light. I began to sketch a plan to save Muni Light. Once that plan was set in motion, the Cleveland cityscape would begin to experience political weather unlike any which had ever occurred. <laughs> really. The plan to save Muni Light. One, demand a sale, attack the sales price as a giveaway. Two, demand an appraisal of Muni Light. Three, demand a competitive bid to slow down the sale. Four, seek another bidder to make the private companies bid an issue. Five, show Muni Light customers their rates would go up. Six, show the private utilities customers their rates will go up. Seven, analyze the finances of Muni Light. Eight, demonstrate that Muni Light's making a profit. Nine, search all legal venues 
to challenge the sale. 10, develop a grassroots campaign to save Muni Light. 11, create a campaign for a referendum to tie up the sale. The plan was ready. I could rest for a few hours. So <laughs> that, that really describes a process that takes place in the moment where you want to do something. Uh, there is a metaphysics, a physics of change. You, you, we're, we're told that reality, this is it, as I mentioned a moment ago, this is the nature of reality, this is it, you can't change it. But the truth is that multiple realities exist simultaneously. You know, in, in physics, you have particles that are, that are called gluon. They're, 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 they hold the interstitial space together. These are particles that are unobserved. They're massless. They, they bind other particles. Well, in, in that other dimension, which is part of, of the world, we, it's the unseen, it's from that dimension that we call forth what it is, the world that we want. Now when that occurs, when that other world just suddenly appears, people will say, wow, it's a miracle. Uh, no, it's, it's been there all, all along. <laughs> uh, so what we're here talking about is the creation of a possible future which is coming. That's what Burning Man represents. It represents the future that's on its way. So, so with that, I uh, bring you one of my, uh, the words of one of my advisors, uh, Alfred Lord Tennyson, who, who once wrote, come my friends, Tis not too late to seek a newer world. Come, my friends, tis not too late to seek a newer world. Thank you. Thank you. R Rosie, could I borrow that mic? So we're going to go into Q&A now. So if you have any questions, you can come queue up right over there in the back of this aisle, and I'll meet you there with a microphone. Who has a burning question? Burning. Yes, Crimson, come on over here. Lynn, are you running for president? <laughs> Check, please. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm involved, uh, as we all are. You know, it's about being involved in our in our community, in the world, in our country, in the world, and uh, and I would advise all of you who are looking for candidates. Our first obligation is to be as presidents of our own lives, and to show people that empire of self can uh, become something that can merge with others who re achieve a kind of self-sufficiency and an ability to to be able to function without, without a state. <laughs> wow. Uh, you know. So rather than get accused of, uh, of not answering that question, <laughs> I'm going to say no comment. <laughs> OK, okay. Hey, next question. Sorry. Our next question, what is your name? Regina Longlank. Could um, you make sure you speak loud enough Okay, Regina Longlank. Um, when I was my first year at Burning Man and I was a greeter, I would pull people out of the car and push them down on the hood and kick their legs apart. And I would ask them, how many years had you known about Burning Man before you came? <laughs> and that's how many spankings they got. So I want to know that from you and also why. Why how did many, you go? How many years I've known? Is that what you, um, I, I was, I, I'll tell you what happened. I'm in London. Somebody tells me, this so is how it worked with me. I'm in London uh, meeting with, um, uh, what's his name, Julian Assange? And, <laughs> yeah. And, 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 so, and, and so he's telling me about, 
uh, Amidalen in Sweden. And, and I, uh, it's, who's here? Is there? Gustav. Okay, Gustav. So, so I go to this event in Sweden on an, on an island. It's called Amadal, and it's really, a, you know, it's a celebration of, it's like an elm festival, but beyond that, it is where people merge with all types of political thinking and, and disciplines, and, and they have this very civil discussion. <laughs> it's so foreign to where I'm from, but... <laughs> Uh, so I, I met Gustav jo Josephson at Amadalen, and Gustav told me about Burning Man. Now, so, so thank you. You see what happens? Here I am. Whoa. So, so I, uh, and just as I was in London uh, talking to Julian Assange, and I learned about. Um, Amidalen, I go to Amidalen, I learn about Burning Man. I come here and I can't even tell you what I'm finding out. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so follow your, your instincts, your intuition, that's what, that, that's fiery as well, yes. Uh, just so everyone knows, Katiana, could you raise your hand please? Katya's over there, you can queue up oh, with Katya another, okay, as well. We're on. So uh, we're going to take our next question over here, Dennis. Okay. Hi, hello. I'm Gonzo from Boston. And the uh, question I have for you is, uh, how were you transformed or changed by Burning Man? And would you describe uh, an experience related to that? And uh, of course, the add-on one, will you come back next year? <laughs> uh, I absolutely intend to return. So Mary and I'll be talking about it. <laughs> Thank you. You bet. Here's what it was like, and, I, and maybe uh, you know, and maybe some of you had the same experience. Um, and hold on, testing. Okay, so the minute I, I arrived, uh, you know, after spending a few hours trying to get in, uh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, we don't let anybody in with a tie. <laughs> <laughs> Den Dennis, would you tell them how you got to Black Rock City, please? How oh, I... How you got there. Yeah, I, I drove. <laughs> yeah. I, I, so, so I walk, onto the, I, I walk onto the playa after I get through with meetings and stuff, and I, it, had, uh, it, was, it was about close, close to dusk. And as... As far as I could see in any direction where, you know, my, including embracing the potential of my peripheral vision, I could see, see this entire scope of, of all these colors, forms, and shapes, and, and, and I'll tell you, just like that, I got it. <laughs> I, I'm really, it was like, I, I didn't need to, I, I had it. It just, that was the moment. It was a moment of just stepping onto the playa. Happened right there. I just got the whole thing. It was like, like, you know, we, we, we like to think we have to breathe in and be at a place forever and ever. And no, it's like a, if, you, if you think in fractals, you can kind of absorb uh, and, and experience uh, life in a, in a way you can just, like in a, in a blink of an eye, you get something. You get it fully. It can change your life. That's how quick it was for me. Thank you. Let's take a question from the other side of the room. Hi, I'm Ray Richman. I'm a board member of the Burning Man Project. Thank you so much for being here. And I'm wondering if you were going to pull out your yellow pad and make a list of what the Burning Man Project should be doing to spread its ethos around the world, what would those action items be? Uh, I, I think I probably should attend a few workshops before I get into that, you know. <laughs> so should we all, right? Um, I, you know, I'm, I, I, want to, uh, I, I want to say that there's a spirit that, which animates the involvement of everyone here. It's what it, it, each one, each person in this room is here as a result of a personal journey that you've taken. And, and, and what, what impels that journey, I think, is a, is a quest for freedom. It's probably more powerful an impulse in the world today than ever because of the fear, because of the kind of... Uh, uh, fascism that 
has, has moved along to impress itself upon uh, organized uh, politics. And yet, what's happening is that this, um, this spirit that moves within us, which is also the spiritus mundi, it is the spirit of the world, uh, we, we need to affirm, and, we, and those of us who are here have done that to ourselves, and then we have to help others affirm the, and validate the, the feelings they have about the state of affairs. It, things don't need to keep being this way. They, they don't uh, need to be as, um, as the poet Matthew Arnold wrote in describing conditions at the beginning of World War I, um, a darkling plain swept by confused alarms of struggle and flight where ignorant armies clash at night. No, it doesn't have to be that. We have as a birthright joy, happiness, love, and and people, we're at, a, we're at a time where it needs to be affirmed that those are the principles that should animate the world, that those are the principles that hold up the world, that those are the principles that make life worth living. And everybody's looking for that. And so we affirm that. You notice I didn't mention Democrat or Republican. So, so we, and, and so, to talk about where Burning Man goes. I mean, that's like a, that is your, that is part of your intuitional power through your involvement that gets sharpened so that you can help direct the course. Um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, the, I, I'm not there yet to give a, a summary, but I sure am interested in working with all of you because I think that, that what you're involved in is really creating a world that, that is not just worth living in, but that everyone loves to live in. And, and, and that really is what it's about. It's about, a, it's about connecting with a deeper sense of joy. So um, I'll, I'll bring my yellow notepad to, uh, to some of the sessions. I'll be there. <laughs> OK. Th thank you for that question, Ray. Uh, we'll come over here to. Hello. Hello, I'm a little under the weather, but. My name is Roman. I am from Washington, D.C. right now, but I'm an Ohioan. I'm from Akron, Ohio. And I'm a civil rights attorney, and I would like to first, for a moment, embody Marion's uh, principle of gratitude. I'm so grateful to you, Dennis, for trusting and saying yes to Rosie, to that connection that you found out on the playa, and saying yes to your own journey to be here. It's a big deal to me. I'm sure everyone yeah. can agree. Thank you. Thank you. And my question for you, Dennis, is do you have anything to say about communication or working with our friends on the other side of the proverbial aisle, Grover Nordquist, those folks who are also experiencing a Burning Man experience right. and talking about it? Yes. I, 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 the, the thing, the greatest, um, the, <laughs> the greatest challenge in our time politically is the way we think. Um, you know, we, we are, we're not victims of the world we see, we become victims of the way we see the world. And, and, if, we, and if we engage in thinking, uh, partisan thinking is essentially dichotomous thinking us versus them, whoever they are. Be with me on this. It's about uh, rich versus poor, about black versus white, about Democrats versus Republicans, any kind of uh, um, opposites you want to, to look at. And the polarities that are created by this dichotomous thinking, we call government. Uh, and, and so what, what, it's up, what it's up to all of us to do is to step out of the polarity, to, to take a journey into what uh, uh, the writer, the, the uh, poet Blake 
writes about the, the unity of opposites. Uh, the, the lion laying down with the lamb, uh, and uh, and the lamb actually being being able to avoid being mutton chops. <laughs> uh, the um, and and this is really an important life lesson because we we need to <coughs> we need to disavow a partisan approach. The, the thing, the reason, I, when I was elected mayor of Cleveland, I was elected as an independent, and I, I will tell you that even though I, I was in the Congress, elected as a Democrat, I had a tough time going to meetings where people were talking all the time about, not just about polling and raising money, but also about uh, how bad the Republicans were, because it was, it was, it was like so, a group thing, so stupid. And, and groupthink is, is, annihilates the world. We need, to, we, need to, we need to hold on to our individuality. So what I did through 16 years in Congress, never got into an argument on a partisan basis. That's number one. Never, if somebody attacks you, uh, you, don't, you don't get into personal attacks. There's a, a principle in, um, uh, that some of my, uh, I have an Orthodox uh, Jewish rabbi friend. On his, on his refrigerator, he's got a bumper sticker that says, Lashen Hora, don't even think about it. <laughs> and, and, and that Lashen Hora is derogatory speech. And, and so don't get into derogatory speech. It demeans you. Now, that's not easy, you know, because Washington, D.C. is like the capital of Lashen Hora. So, <laughs> and our country. So, uh, and, and, and polarized politics, and dichotomous thinking, and what does dichotomous thinking eventually produce? Come on, help me. Conflict, conflict right. What, what kind of conflict? War, that's right. So, so that's why partisan politics represent, at this point in the development of our country, a real danger of helping to keep war going. You wonder why wars keep going? One reason is that it's this dichotomous thinking. So what do you do? Of course you reach out to people, whatever party, whatever the affiliation they are connected to, whatever ideology they may represent. Look, I do political analysis for Fox. You think I agree with some of the things that are said there? <laughs> well, really, think about it. But you know what? The idea is to engage with people and to find out how they think, why they think, and to try to bring that into your awareness so that you can lead a new path, that's all. And so it's about embracing <laughs> And not about changing what you stand for. Yes. Let's go to Kati's side. Uh, hi, my name is Daniel Zen. I'm a new New York regional representative. And first of all, thank all right. you very much for being here. Uh, I had a question a little bit more bipartisan. I was wondering what, I mean, we've been engaging the civil uh, community and at the state level. And I'm wondering what we can do and what you can do to help us to encourage people at the national level, both uh, Democratic leaders and your friends at Fox News, to come uh, to Burning Man? Well, I, I, you know, I, I think that uh, that's going to happen, but you don't want too much of it. <laughs> <laughs> My bad. Uh, anyhow. <laughs> no. I mean, really, it, it's, good to, it's good to give people a chance to be open to the experience. But, you know, and just so you put it out there and, and, and let people know. I mean, from my point of view, I'd have no difficulty at all uh, sharing uh, my experience with people who I've served with. That's easy. And to tell them why I think it's important. But people, and each of you know this, there's a certain process of self-selection that takes place. <laughs> you see that once you step on the plier, right? <laughs> <laughs> Hello. So. Uh, and, and so we, we encourage people to, to expand themselves, and that's what it's about. And, and I, uh, how are we on time, Rosie? Because I know it's got to be. We have time for two more questions, one from this okay, side. Okay, because there's, there's something I wanted to say before we wrap up. Go ahead. Do you want to go into that now? Well, yeah, I want to mention it because it might produce some more questions. I'll make it real quick, though. One of the things that I did uh, in, in my time in Congress uh, one of the things that really bothered me is I saw how easy it was for Congress to slip into authorizing war. And I, uh, when you really understand what, it, what it's about and how war is such a racket, I mean a racket, and, and um, 
and how so many innocent people are swept up in it by millions and millions. I, 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 I had done studying in, uh, uh, in, in my, as I started in Congress about uh, war and how over a million innocent people perished in wars in the 20th century. Most of them, you know, non -com we're talking non-combatants, most of them innocent, innocent civilians who had no connection with either side. I started to think about that, and I started to think about this idea about war being inevitable, right? You can't do anything about it, it's just gonna happen, right? And so the kind of thinking that I developed over a period of time in Cleveland as a working government I started to apply that to, well, maybe war is not inevitable. And it challenged these situations where people say you have to, you have to, you have to go to war. And um, I developed a proposal that some of you may have heard about. It was a proposal for a cabinet level Department of Peace. Now, the, not, not, because government, not because Washington needs another bureaucracy, but, but, but for this reason. To bring into the conscious awareness of the nation that a president ought to have people who can advise him as to a path to peace instead of how to conduct a war. That's number one. But that's on, a, that's on an international level. What I'm about to say to you, I want each one of you to think about this because you might be able to integrate this into the work that you're doing in a local community. At a domestic level, the Department of Peace would look at issues that, that need to be looked at and dealt with and, organ and have an organized approach. Domestic violence, spousal abuse, child abuse, to, to reach into families and to actually offer help, not from a judgmental point of view, but to help people find their, the, the angels of their better nature, um, to look at outside the home, gang violence, gun violence. These, these are all things we need to work on, racial violence, violence against gays, police Community clashes, this is, and this is something that's absolutely urgent. We, we, right now, have a great tragedy that continues to unfold in America of the use of deadly force, particularly against, uh, uh, against African-American males. It, it, is, it is colossal in its, um, in its injustice and in its implications. We, through a Department of Peace, just like I talked about all the other things it could address, we, we have to reestablish a relationship between people and those who are sworn to defend the law in, in communities. And it has to be done in, in a structured way uh, and, and not, not have the kind of separation uh, that is producing uh, these tragedies that, and, that cannot in any way ever be justified. And so I mention these, th these things because, well, a Department of Peace is an interesting idea for the federal government take an organized approach towards this, each one of us in our communities can find a way to get involved in these various areas where the inevitability of violence, which we're told is so much a part of who we are as a country, no, it is not. We, it is not. That is not who we are. We don't accept that. And so, but again, it's about taking a structured approach and, and, and looking at it in the community in a, in a, through a community, starting at that level from multiple places all over the world. Rosie, and if you have any more time, or if I would you guys like a couple more questions? Would you like a couple more questions and a shorter break? Okay, a quick question: Who here is interested in starting a local Department of Peace? Uh, okay, <laughs> Black Rock Rangers. I like that. Yeah. Uh, you know, well, here's what I'll do then. Here's here's what I'm going to do. I will. I have a website, Kasinich.com. And I'll, uh, uh, I'll put, uh, I'll build some content into it uh, within the next couple of weeks, and then uh, I'll let uh, Marion know about it, and uh, you know, for those who are interested, maybe you could create a link uh, at the, on a Burning Man site. And, and, I, and I'd be happy to engage with you as to ideas on how to build this, how to, how to build this out. I mean, it's time, it really is time. And, uh, and, 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 and who else to do it but burners, right? Great, okay, we're gonna take two questions. Hi Dennis, my name is Heather, I'm from Vancouver, BC, and ex of Cleveland, and uh, I have a question around um, your 
your very excellent career as an elected official, a well-respected person who took on the mantle of becoming a politician. In today's world, with the Tea Party style politics, the word politician has become a dirty word. There's an assumption of corruption, and there's an assumption that you're, you're going to be bent the moment that you get in there. How do we get young people to choose the noble calling of public service when politician is a dirty word? And I've got to tell you, this is a very personal question for me. I'm in my fourth term as a city councillor in Vancouver. Thank you. Thank you for serving. And I know there are a few people who are connected with this program today who, who either have or are serving in public life. Thank you. Uh, young people are looking for authenticity. If they see something that looks fake, they don't want anything to do with it. And, and we need to call people forward to public service. And, and not to, uh, and it's always, there's always been that seamy side. Today it's worse than ever though, frankly, because Supreme Court decisions make uh, money king. And, and it's a problem because it, it, it creates a whole new political culture where politicians are just all about raising money and then everything else comes after that. We need young people to be called forward to serve at a local level, locally, you know, to, to help people, to work on environmental projects, to, to, uh, to mentor, to guide others, to, uh, to be of service to seniors, to, in hospitals, and, you know, just to, to get that, to get the, 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 the piquancy of, of, of helping others, of, of service, and then let people decide later on if they, if they want to, run for office. But I'll tell you, there's another thing, too. When you, when you get involved in issues in a community, wherever you're from, if there's no one advocating the cause that you advocate, and you know that it really matters to people, then you have to be the one. You have to step forward, not have nine people step backwards. You have to be the one, <laughs> really. And, and I, really, I mean, it's like, I, 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 when I was, I understood when I was in high school that I wanted to have a life in public service. I knew it. But some other people are called in a moment. They know they have to stand up. And so we, we need to reach out to young people. But in order to, I'll say this, in order to encourage young people to come into politics, we have to change politics. We have to change the way it is and then cause young people to be so excited about being involved because we're challenging the, uh, the corruption that exists right now in a system, and that we understand that system cannot be maintained. It's wobbling, it's ready to fall apart, and we have to be the ones who, who bring that light, uh, bring the fire, and, and cause it to, when it, when it burns away, there's a whole new world. So that's up to us, and then we can welcome the young people in. Thank you. We'll take one more question. One more question, one more okay. Yes, hello. Uh, my name is Maya, and first of all, thank you for being so exquisitely beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I, you know, thank you, and I, and I knew my Willie Nelson t-shirt. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I knew that would do it. <laughs> so so I, I shall wear this from now on. Yeah. Great. <laughs> so... One of the miracles that happens on the playa is catalyzed by the gifting economy that takes place. Yet we're straddling these two worlds where we're also still in this uh, war-based economy and creating a new economy to work with reflecting our values. What can you tell us, what would you like us to know about how we can use money or your thoughts about things that we can use to transition? Well, um mm. <laughs> and now we go into the secret society of money, <laughs> the creature from Jekyll Island. Uh, here's what a what a final question, <laughs> because because and, and actually I I have been studying monetary policy for many years now, 10 years to be exact. And I, um, uh, I, I was introduced to monetary policy by the, the woman who would eventually become my wife. Uh, and and uh, uh, Elizabeth was working on that years previously. And through her, I, I learned the following. 
that um, that the monetary system that we have right now hasn't always been the system that existed in this country. There was a lot of bartering and trading going on, and and then um, um, and then just let's jump j jump an, an epic here. In 19, uh, uh, th that if you look at the Constitution of the United States, the the power of the uh, Constitution. I have a copy of it here, by the way, in case, <laughs> in case the other one disappears. I got the other copy, uh, and and in the Constitution it says, uh, under Article One, Section Eight, that Congress has the power to coin or create money. Now, what that did when the, the founders wanted to keep the money power, you know connected to the people, have, have the people have control over it. But what happened in 1913, uh, a, it all changed. Uh, the Federal Reserve Act was passed and it privatized money. It actually privatized the money supply so that banks then could create money out of nothing and, uh, and, and get enormous wealth. It actually set the stage for, uh, for the conditions that we have today in America where wealth is accelerating to the top. Uh, you know, I'm giving you a shorthand on this. I introduced legislation after f f five, six years of study to create um, the National Employment, uh, what I call the National Employment Defense Act, and Emergency Defense Act. And it would enable the government to reclaim the power that it had to, to, uh, to be able to create money so that you could create jobs, make it possible for everyone to go to work, rebuild America's infrastructure, which everybody says you can't do because we don't have the money, right? But we could borrow money from banks to do it, right? Um, and to, uh, to be able to let everyone in this country have a fully paid college education free, you know, we could, we could do that. <laughs> to, to, um, to make it possible for us to restore the environment. It's not like we have to borrow. This is the whole relationship to money. You know, money equals debt right now. And as long as money equals debt, we are all in trouble. And so, uh, this is like another story for another day, but it's something that I'm thinking about in terms of how you transform the economy we have right now, which is, is really a dead-end economy for more and more people, and how do you create an economy that, where there's a place for everyone, where everyone has a chance, and where there's, and where there's real, truly a, a, a just basis for it. So I'm, you know, I'm, I am working uh, to try to define that and to write about it, and uh, if, you're, if there's something you're concerned about, uh, I'll, that's an, another area, Kucinich.com, which I know I have to start building out. You're giving me so much work to do today. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Um, I want to thank you, uh, each and every one of you. Marion, go, go back to you. Thank you for making it possible for me to uh, uh, go to Burning Man the last time. Gustav, thank you for telling me about Burning Man. Rosie, thank you for bringing me here. And all of you, thank you. Uh, thank you for making me possible because e each one of us uh, speaks to uh, each other uh, through our hearts. And each one of us helps each other grow and, and become better than we are and, and more than we are and to increase that, that wonderful tempo towards uh, human evolution where we create the new world. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Love you, thanks.